Okay. Um, I have a question. How would you, and I know we've kind of like mentioned it briefly, but how would you describe who Jesus is to someone who has some prior background knowledge about him, um, but doesn't know a lot, but is interested in, you know, becoming a Christian, becoming a believer? How would you kind of explain like who Jesus is to them? Would anybody like to answer? Okay, that's all right. That's all right. I'm gonna pose the question. Oh, Ariel, go ahead. I'll lean for the floor. Um, I think you said to a person who has some type of knowledge. Who has some type of knowledge, yes. So I would say that he's the way. Um and he is, I think I would just say that, like, he's our only hope. And it's something that we should live for him because we have an end goal, basically. Like, where are we going? We have somewhere to go after when we pass. So it's something you should believe because you don't want to go to hell. I really think I would say that. <laughs> so what if they don't really understand and I don't want to go into like the whole why and what of questions but what if they are like what do you mean he's the way like would you further elaborate on that so I would think he's our savior like I don't know he's the one that he saves us you know he's the one that gives us life I don't know how else more to explain that without I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Like he's he's just a way of living. Would you be comfortable? Oh, I'm sorry. Did somebody else say something? Yeah, I was gonna say. Um, I would say he was a man that was pro prophesied about hundreds of years prior to his coming, and when he came, he fulfilled a lot of those prophecies said about him, and in those prophecies, and him himself said that he was the son of God and he came to bring the kingdom on earth. And I would explain some of his other teachings that may apply to the said person and explain that how the only way to have a relationship with him is to have faith with him. And in relationship with him, you get access to God and the kingdom of heaven that he's bringing on earth. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> good, There's, those are both good answers. Um, another question, would all of y'all, any of y'all feel comfortable? And I, again, I know we probably um, spoke about this briefly before, but would you feel comfortable with really explaining your your life, like your past, like how Paul is about to do in this next chapter, like kind of really laying it out there, being vulnerable, not really leaving out detail well I mean you can leave out some details, but you know, just being vulnerable and open with them and honest about who you were and who you are now and does it match like are you actually walking in what you're saying like are you actually walking in the person you are now as you're explaining it to this person would you yeah. all feel comfortable or in too because you that's how you be relatable for them to say okay I want to believe so what did you do to get to this point and I think we always overcome so yeah for sure and it make them feel more comfortable to hear what you're trying to teach them yes this is all true yeah we're all testimonies whether you're still new um to this walk just the fact that one we're alive <laughs> um and we're breathing and we're in our right minds some of us <laughs> And, you know, we're healthy and things like that. Like, just that alone is testimony. And then, again, going back to who you were and how you overcame everything with Jesus, because you didn't do it by yourself, didn't do it alone, with Jesus and accepting um, him in your heart. Like Ariel said, I think that would just help with being relatable. Um, Pastor Mike says, you can always practice by sharing with each other. That is a good, we might do that one day. Good little role playing situation. All right. 
Now I am in X26. Does anybody have any questions? I know I ran through X25, but I wanted to get into this. Any questions? Comments, concerns? Okay. So, all right. X26. Paul is now before King Agrippa and basically just kind of lays everything out there um, and really just gives his testimony. So I'm going to go to verse four. Verse four says, this is Paul speaking. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child. From the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem, they have known me for a long time and can testify if they are willing that I conform to the strictest sect excuse me, of our religion, living as a Pharisee. Um, so Paul is basically defending himself, um, saying that everybody knew who he was, knew about his past, um, and knew that he was a Pharisee. So he was actually persecuting Christians. Um, and then in verse 6, he says, and now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. So Paul basically gave his life to Christ and accepted the call on his life and is now spreading the gospel and believes in the resurrection of Jesus. Um, so because of all these things, his life is like kind of at stake, like he's on trial. And I kind of thought it was funny and how we can relate a little bit to Paul, but thought it was funny that back when he was a Pharisee and living of this world, um, and persecuting people who now believe in the very thing he believes in. I thought it was funny that people didn't really. And of course, I guess this was like a norm back then. But I thought it was funny that nobody was questioning him then. Like, why are you persecuting me? And maybe they were and it's just not in here. But um, nobody was like, hey, why are you persecuting me? Like, I believe in Jesus and things like that. Like, nobody was questioning or challenging him or even threatening his life. But now that he believes in Christ and is trying to tell everybody about him, he's a threat. So does anybody feel that like, because you are a believer, do you feel that people view you differently? Anybody like to share? Well, I'll answer. I do. Sometimes, um, sometimes I feel like people can sort of kind of get the whole like, oh, well, you're corny or you can't have any fun or you think you're better in, than me because you believe in X, Y, and Z. Um, when that's not necessarily the case. Um, so Paul knew his purpose. Paul's life was threatened because of his purpose. Um, and the Jews couldn't even like pinpoint what he did wrong or what his exact charges were. They just like, he believes in somebody that was dead and he claims that this person is alive. He's out of his mind. Um, so again, this is something that I want to encourage you all with. Do not let anybody's opinions discourage you from your walk with Christ. Don't let your past get in the way of your present and your future with God. Do not let opinions. We have all of the facts we need here in this Bible. We have all of the facts. We can back everything up. It is all written in here. So don't let people try to come in and try to confuse you or make you feel like you're doing something wrong because you chose Jesus or make you even feel like an outcast because you chose Jesus. Um, because, I mean, ultimately the joke will be on them, unfortunately, but that's just the truth of the matter. Um, so yeah, don't let, don't let people discourage you from your walk with Christ. And if they can't get on board, then that just means you have to be mindful of who they are, where their mindset is and your relationship to them. All right. So I'm going to go down to verse 14. Let's see. Well, first of all, before I go there, does anyone have any questions? Any, okay. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna go to verse 14. I'm gonna go to nine. Um, he says, I too was convinced that I ought to do 
all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. So again, this is Paul basically telling like, this is what I did. Like I was this person. And he's really laying it all out there for King, King Agrippa to really understand and grasp the power of, of Jesus. And just by him uh, calling out to Paul and how he just in, had faith and completely changed his ways. Like he's trying to trying to really explain who Jesus is and why he believes in Jesus because he changed his life. He wrote, rewrote his story. He changed his story. Um, so I thought that was pretty significant. Okay, so now I'm going to go to verse 14. Um, he says, we all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic. So this is Paul basically explaining how Jesus um, called him out. Um, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you now are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Paul used to be Saul until Jesus called him out and changed his name. With the name change came a new, um, basically like a new, a new person, a new change of heart, a new mindset, um, and a new lifestyle. So this was pretty significant to me because I just kind of took it as if we accept Jesus in our lives, we should move, we should just move accordingly. When Jesus um, calls us, we have to respond. But how we respond and follow up after our response is equally as important as accepting the, uh, the response or accepting the call. So we can just say like, Jesus, I'm here. Um, I believe in you. I trust you. And, but like the next day, we can't even like follow up with that or we can't have that same energy. So we can't expect God to really um, move in our lives if we just aren't following up. We're not applying him in our lives. Um, Jesus can change your name. He can change your heart. He can change your mind. He can change how you wake up in the morning. He can change your routine. He can change so much in your life, but we just have to respond to him. That's it. Um, so in verse 19, King Agrippa says, or no, King Agrippa. So then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. And that alone is like, I'm extra, I'm extra person. So I was like, dang, that's heavy. Because all it took was like one time um, for Jesus to call Paul out. And he didn't have a bunch of questions, or again, it's not written, so maybe he was thinking it, but he didn't respond and like, no, I still want to do what I want to do. Or he didn't respond like, are you sure? Like, you sure you want me to serve you? Like, I don't think I, I don't think I'm the right fit because I used to like kill people for believing in you. Like, I really used to. Uh, go against your will, go against your word and your law. Um, but he simply obeyed Jesus. And I think that's powerful because all most of the time we just need to give Jesus like a yes. We just gotta obey him instead of and and not have all these excuses and all these questions and we shouldn't have to believe, we shouldn't have to physically see him or see him doing different things in our lives in order for us to obey him. Again, we have this book that is filled with characters and people who lived one way and because they heard Jesus or Jesus called them out, 
and they said yes and they obeyed Jesus, they were not, they are now we're now different people. So sometimes that's all we have to do. Like we just shouldn't, we don't need to put up a fight. We just gotta say, just gotta say yes. So this is Paul telling King Agrippa all of these things, his testimony. Um now I have another question. If you were, I guess, King Agrippa and Paul is telling you all of these things, would you want to know more about Jesus and uh, eventually get saved or would you still like need more proof? And I know that can be a hard question to answer because most of us are church kids. So we kind of know a lot about Jesus, but let's just kind of role play a little bit. Um, would it be hard for you to kind of understand where Paul's coming from? Would you be convinced about this man named Jesus? How would how would y'all feel if you were King Grippa and Paul was talking to you and sharing his testimony? I'll say I'll definitely be interested because I'll speak about my own experience. I had a friend who experienced Jesus before I did, and he would explain it to me, and I would listen to him and genuinely be interested and feel a bit of conviction, but I wasn't fully sold on the fact but sooner or later the seed was planted and it grew and I came to know Christ that's good all it takes is one person all it takes is one person and that seed anybody else would like to share okay um so now I'm going to go to verse 22 um, it says, but God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. On verse 23, that the Messiah would suffer and that the first to rise from, rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. So again, we are living testimonies of God's grace. Um, Again, we, we woke up this morning, we're healthy. But we have a past and God allow, can allow you if you haven't fully accepted him yet. Um, but he will allow you to move on from it, to, to look to look over that. I know it's hard and sometimes people will like to dangle it over our head. Sometimes we like to hold our own past over our head and we just can't, can't, can't get over it. But this man, Paul, whose life has been threatened, <clears throat> um, he's been flogged. And he's been in prison for a couple years. Um, and he's still pursuing Jesus. He's still telling us to pursue, pursue Jesus. He's still sharing his testimony um, in spite of everything that he's been through. So just keep that in mind. Um, so verse 24, after Paul is explaining all this to the king, um, th it says, at this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense saying, you are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted, you, your great learning is driving you insane. Um, I think that's kind of crazy, like, not, oh well, yeah, I do think it's kind of crazy to like, did Paul just like pour his, pour his whole heart out, just gave his whole testimony, he done went through the nitty gritty, said everything, and like, somebody said like, no, nah, you're tripping, like, well, how would you say all those things? How would you respond in that moment? And uh, very much so, this could happen to any one of us if we're trying to minister to somebody um, and they don't believe us or they say like, no, nah, I don't want to hear that. Like, how would any of you respond if you would like to answer? How would you respond to just people's ignorance of Jesus? I don't think we should like be, not saying that we're going to be competitive, but I think just like what Rich said about his friend just planting the seed and God got to do the rest. That's it. All you can just take the deer to the water. Can't make him drink. Mm, that's a bar for sure. <laughs> for sure. Okay. So now I'm going to go into verse 25. After um, Festus is calling Paul crazy he says, I am not insane, most excellent, that's this Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am, I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Grippa, do you believe the prophets? 
I know you do. Now, does anybody know why Paul said this to the king? Um, well, King Agrippa um has a Jew, excuse me, has a Jewish background. So earlier in the call, I mentioned who King Agrippa's father was, King Heron, who was the man who tried to kill baby Jesus. Um, so King Her or King Agrippa already knew about, you know, Christ, knew about the Messiah, knew about Jesus a little bit. Um, and as you can kind of read throughout this chapter, verse 26, um, there's not much of dialogue from King Agrippa as Paul is speaking about his testimony. Um, and as we continue to read, it's kind of like King Agrippa is like listening and kind of processing what Paul is saying. Um, but I think the irony in it is Paul is a follower of Jesus, a believer of Jesus, and uh, saw Jesus after, you know, his resurrection. And his father was the one that tried to kill him. I thought that was kind of ironic um, about that. So that's kind of why King Grippa is just like processing it and taking it, taking it in. Um, so verse 28, King Agrippa says, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these change, chains. So may become what I am except for these chains. What do we think Paul is saying here? Paul is saying that he hopes that King Grippa, um, or anybody that is hearing him becomes a true believer, um, gets saved, and you know spreads the gospel. Um, of course, not to be a prisoner, not to be locked up, but to really accept Christ Jesus in um, in their heart. That's kind of what Paul is saying. Um, so then we get down to verse thirty one to thirty two. And it says, after they, after they left the room, they began saying to one another, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So here we see like a little, um, a little bit of compassion from, from um, King Agrippa. We see a little bit of compassion from King Agrippa. And I think part of him, like, be believed Paul a little bit and, like, was definitely interested in what it means to be a believer in Christianity. Um, but just because of what he's saying, like, basically, like, dang, Paul could have been free if he would have never said, like, take me to Caesar. Um, so I just thought that was pretty significant because although it, it may not seem like it's going through to some people, if you minister to them, we may not feel like, Dang, they don't get it. They're not um grasping it. But like Rich said, like all it took was for his friend to plant the seed. And like Ariel said, all we have to do is plant the seed and let God do the rest. Um, so continue to pray for your friends who um are still, you know, trying to find their walk with Jesus or still struggling with it. Pray for them, pray for your fam family members, pray for people at your job, pray for everybody. Do not leave anybody out. Because everybody deserves to hear about Jesus. And I feel like if you are around people that do not know much about him, or if you're around people that do know about Jesus, they just are choosing to live whichever way they want to live. I feel like it is our, it not feel like, it is our job and our responsibility as believers to spread the knowledge and spread it with love. Um, do not make people feel bad. Do not make people feel dumb, but to spread the word of God. And like I mentioned last week, I think um, about, my, about my pop up saying, like, sometimes we need to get saved to help other people. Sometimes we need to get saved to find our walk with Christ, to bring our family, family member closer to Jesus, to bring our brother, our sister, our friend. Um, so just keep that in mind. Although Paul was locked up, he didn't beg and plead to be you know to be free he just simply shared his testimony and we are living and breathing testimonies 
of God's goodness and his mercy and his grace. So let's keep that in mind as we go on about our day. That's it. And that's something that I'm, I'm learning. There's this lady at my job. Um, and she's kind of like into some witchcraft, you know, tarot reading and, and like the little crystal things, all of those things. And, um, but she also talks about Jesus. And, like, we've had a conversation before, and she said that, like, you know, she loves Jesus and all those things. And then, like, in the same breath, it was like, yeah, I got to my tarot card reading. And and then, like, I was like, okay. <laughs> so I heard her out. <laughs> I let her finish. <laughs> um, But I prayed. I really, I was like, God, like, this lady said, X, Y, Z, and she over here saying that she read her whatever, like, it just kind of, it, it confused me a little bit, but, and that's something that I know now, that would have been a perfect opportunity to fly a little bit of Jesus in there, like, hey, you want to, you know, you want to go grab some lunch, you want to go hang out, like, I just want to, you know, talk to you, it doesn't have to be forceful, but I definitely should have seized the, <laughs> the moment and told her um, that Jesus don't care about the cards, one that's not Jesus, and them crystals. I wouldn't have said it like that, <laughs> but you know, just opening that door so she can, because a lot of it is ignorance. Like people think that because they mention Jesus that they're spiritual and things like that. Um, but a lot of it is just they just mention Jesus because they know about they know about him, but they don't know him. So again, it is our job and responsibility to spread the gospel, to spread his word. And if you don't know, if you don't feel comfortable. Find somebody that you can hopefully trust within our church, our wonderful youth pastor, aka my deity. He is a good, <laughs> he's a good resource. He all right. He knows a little bit about the Bible. Like, come go to him. There's tons of people in our church that you can go to that can help you kind of walk through it. And most importantly, pray. Pray for that person, especially if you work with them, see them every day. Pray for them. Okay. So that is Acts 26. Anybody have anything you want to say? You can put it in the chat if you would like any questions, any takeaways. Anybody want to share any takeaways from these two chapters? Hey, Gab, you mentioned um, earlier, pretty, you were asking about what our thoughts are, if any, any pressures of us being Christians. And I think you just, for me, you kind of hit on it. Um, just remembering that we are that body of Christ you know, that we represent God and the way we walk. So I guess that's the pressure for me. I have to kind of take a step, step back if there's certain situations, but okay, you know what, let me uh, kind of adjust differently. You know, I'm representing Christ. So that's, that's the pressure for me. Yeah, I agree. And like, I can honestly say as I was growing up, I've been in church, most of y'all know, most of y'all been in church with me all of our lives. Right. And I definitely had a phase in my life. Where I was like, oh, I don't want anybody to know that I can't go out on Friday. I, I go to church. Like, I was just, <laughs> I was that person. I was ashamed, I can honestly say. And I was, like, just scared um, about how people viewed me. Because I was, like, I was pretty cool in high school, I guess I would say. Um, <laughs> so, like, everybody knew me pretty much. I knew everybody. You know, I was an athlete or whatever, star athlete, you know. But... I was so ashamed to like say like I love Jesus. One, I can say my relationship with Jesus was not where it is today, for sure. But I still loved him back then, um, as I do now. And I was just so like, like I wanted to invite my friends to church, and they just was not with it. Like they was out partying. I was at revival Thursday night. Like, so it just was really hard for me to open up um but now that I'm older and a lot of things have happened from then and now um my past has happened I'm like very passionate about spreading spreading the gospel spreading the word because I know I know who I was and where I was how I thought how I acted how I talked Oof, I, I, I just know and it's like, dang, he brought you from there to here. Like, you got to tell everybody. Everybody that is, even people that, like, are expressing an interest or that mention Jesus, like, that means they know a little bit about him. They know his name. 
So that's just like a door, just like a door opening for you to kind of slide just in there. And again, of course, we like we've said before, you don't want to be forceful about it. You don't want to shove Jesus down your throat, their throats for sure. But if we we might just like miss the moment where we can just minister to somebody um, and introduce them to Jesus. And this is probably like a hard question, but how do you, if a person that was in church and they have, they got hurt, I guess, with church hurt, because that's what I find with a lot of people that say, well, I got hurt by the church. I don't want nothing to do. How do you respond to that? That's a good question. And I've heard that a lot too. That's definitely a thing. Um, I've thought about that uh, for a long time, but I would, my approach now, because before I'm like, oh, just invite them to your church. <laughs> and that like, that's not always a, the answer because, you know, HDIC is, it, it could be a lot for some people. So you kind of want to ease them, <laughs> ease them in. But I would say, just invite them out with you. And whether it's to a restaurant or just a casual meeting place where y'all can talk about Jesus. And again, share your testimony. Um, and maybe even like restart to uh, read the Bible with them. Pick out some scriptures. Ask them, okay, well, what are some things that you're struggling with? Is it love? Is it hurt? Is it, is it stress? Is it whatever it is. Try to find, because it's all in here. Again, this, is, this Bible is a road map. So it's all in here. Um, try to find some things, some scriptures that you can pull out and just sit with them and talk. Make them feel comfortable because sometimes a lot of people feel bad because they what they've been through in the church. They feel bad. They're scared to show their face in the church because of how people might view them or they might not feel welcome and things like that. So just kind of walk them through it. And then eventually, if they want to come to church with you, invite them to your church. If not, you can send them to another church. If you know another church, send them to another church church but I would definitely say like sit down with them and talk to them get to know them first as a person ask hey before we start eating can, can we pray like just kind of ease it in that way so that's just me does anybody else want to answer would they do something differently again you can put it in the chat if you would like um, can I say something oh you sure can um just to um, I guess respond to Ariel's comment. Um, people get hurt at work, but they still go. <laughs> I mean, uh, I understand the uh, people being hurt at church. I, I understand that comment. Uh, people said the church has hurt them, and it's really people. People have hurt you. The church has not done anything to you. It's... Uh, Issues of conflict that have occurred with people. Uh, but you could have a conflict with a coworker, you still gonna go to that job. You may not like how the doctor treats you or the nurse treats you that day, but you still that doesn't mean you're gonna change the doctor. You may, you know, there's this, so we have to kind of things happen because. None of us are perfect. We're people. We make mistakes and we're learning and all growing at the same time. So when an individual says they have church hurt, I would want to dig a little deeper and see what the real issue is. Because sometimes there really is church hurt. And then sometimes it's just that their feelings have been hurt because they've been, uh, for some reason, I don't know why, there could be a hundred different reasons, but I would just want to drill down on that just to get a little um, more information. And uh, there's a question in the chat. I yeah. actually have that. So my question is kind of going back to the Bible studies. Um, I think it was Jackie's maybe. Yeah, maybe it was Jackie's. But from that friendship, from your standpoint, are you getting anything from them? What fruit are they bearing that are you gaining anything from them that you feel that you're going to lose a friendship? That would be my question to you. Um, I will also Can answer. Somebody uh, explain what church hurt is. Yes, church hurt. I feel like there's a bunch of definitions, but 
Um, somebody who used to go to church and then they stopped going for like my dad said, there's a bunch of reasons why that person could have stopped going. But let's say, for example, pastor was preaching about sex. That's a big one. Um, and just kind of saying like, if you're having sex before marriage, it's wrong. And you might be going to hell if you keep doing it. Like things like that. Um, things that are actually true. Some people might flip it and say, well, like, I don't want to go to church no more. Like, they're not talking about what I want to hear. They're not preaching about things that I feel like is relevant. Like, again, there's different answers. Somebody else could jump chime in and say, but I think I also oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I think people get correction um mistaken with church hurt yeah. because you feel condemned, but yet you feel like, oh my God, they're you know, you're saying I'm going to go to hell or, and what about what you're doing? You know what I'm saying? So I think that's like another form of church hurt too, is really correction, but it's really not hurt. Yeah, right. Jumping then, back, I'm so sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Too, I also feel like church hurt can also be not, it could be what they said as well, but it can also be um, going to somebody, maybe expressing the things that you've been dealing with going through and they kind of give you like a, a weird look or kind of maybe turn away from you in a sense like that. So not necessarily even just from a sermon, but maybe also going to a trusted person to kind of express what it is you're going through, hoping to get some help or some guidance. And they kind of just take it as a like a beat down in a sense. I feel like that's also a way that you can have that church hurt. Right. Um, a comment in the chat says the church is just a building. It's the people that's in the church that's jealous, that's sad, that's a mess that can really hurt a person's feelings. Then they leave the church because of what mother or deacon said. Now the church member, church numbers members are going down because of someone that kept hurting people. So yeah. So there's a bunch of different things, and you say it's hurt hurt because that's where obviously we attend. But it's just people. Um, so I hope, did that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, I got my answer. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Jackie, has a comment. Jackie has a comment. And I, I feel like just another thing that needs to be addressed with that too is, yes, as believers, especially young people, because I feel like we're having some young people join us, which is great. But also um, the more seasoned people too, I feel like it's also very important to kind of, monitor how we approach people as well because we have other generations that are coming in and even just other visitors um and like first lady would say or even just in general we're starting to see people that aren't the norm coming to church so we have to be very mindful of how we're approaching people but then I also take it in the sense of this as well I understand um church hurt and things that are happening but I also feel like it's important to evaluate the reason why you're even going to church because like Pastor Mike said you get hurt in every way which way shape or form work friends, whatever the case is, but at the end of the day, you're going to church or whatever the case is for your own personal gain, for your own relationship. So I get it that other people around you may be doing things um, that may hurt you or kind of try to hinder you in your growth. But at the end of the day, I feel like that's the moments where you really want to take that time to really dig deep into the Bible or even like really pay attention to the sermon and know for yourself, because that's what's going to help you get through those moments of hurt. So I feel like that's also an important factor to just keep in the back of your mind. Right. And before I read the other comments in the chat, um, like Ed, to piggyback off of what Jackie's saying, like when you come to church, you have to know Jesus for yourself or if you are just like you're new to this walk you have to do some homework you have to prepare um you can't just come to church and then expect oh I got everything I need to know about Jesus like that I'm going to heaven now like I got it I got it it's really not that simple and it's not that easy this is a lifestyle day after day week after week month after month um walk with Christ so you have to take your time and I feel like a lot of people's um, a lot of people are frustrated because they don't understand. They don't know. And a lot of it is curiosity. They have questions. And it, it, I understand it can be intimidating and tough to find people in the church that you may be visiting because you don't know everybody. Um, but that's when, that's why we have these youth Bible studies. That's why we have each other. 
are all somewhat close to age, <laughs> except for Ariel and Pastor Mike. But um, we're all <laughs> similar and close to age. We are learning and we're growing together. And most of us have been in church all of our lives. Not saying that we have the answers, but we can help lead you to the people that have the answers. So for sure, um, Cheyenne, let me find it. Cheyenne said... Um, I think that if more people shifted their mindset to the fact that the gospel comes to correct and not condemn, we would hear less of church hurt because, like Ariel said, sometimes correction is confused with the condemnation. Absolutely. And so a lot of people can't take, can't stand correction. I know I'm one of those people. I struggle. I don't like being told what to do. But because I want to grow in God and I have to put my put myself last, put Jesus first, that I know that I need to, okay, this is what I'm doing wrong acknowledge it own up to it and learn how i can move forward um with my walk um and the last two comments in the chat say that's how people wear masks over their face not because sickness but different spirits never know what the per that person is going going through feeling happy or angry towards you always be ready to people in my church i call them, i call them bipolar spirits all right so i hope that was it for that because I'm going to move on to chapter Philippians 3. Um okay, so Philippians 3. Um I don't know if your Bible has like little headings, but mine does, and it's the heading for this chapter is no confidence in the flesh. Um, so we're gonna start out with verse two. Um, verse two says, watch out for those dogs those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Before I go any further, does anybody care to explain what the the, the flesh is? I don't want to put quotes, but the flesh. What does it mean to be in the flesh? Or what does the flesh mean? Your own will. Mm -hmm. That's good. Anybody else? You can put it in the chat if you want. I'll add to that. I'll say your own will, which is most times sin. Yes, exactly. Um, so the flesh um, to me leads to the urge to sin. Um, now we're all born into sin, okay? But we must die to our flesh. We gotta fight it. We must die to our flesh. And that's hard. It is for sure. Um, but we have to, if you want to grow in Christ and ultimately go to heaven, that's it. Um, so the scripture mentions, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, and those mutilators of the flesh. Does anybody want to give some examples as to who or what those kind of things may be? Dogs, evildoers, mutilators. Anything that goes against Christ? Yes. Anything or anyone that feeds our flesh and compromises our relationship with, with Jesus. Whether that's friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, families, mom, dad, auntie, uncle, anybody and everybody can get it. Okay. People that aid to your flesh. Um, so yes, that's that. All right. So now I'm going to go down to verse five. I'll read like a little bit above it. Um, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, the Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Um, so I had to do like some research on this, and Paul is basically explaining um, how he lived in the flesh throughout his life or up until he uh, met Jesus or heard from Jesus. Um, so he mentions circumcision. Y'all know what that is. But <laughs> in the Bible, it's represented as like a covenant with God. That's what circumcision kind of resembles. So he goes from there, him being circumcised um, eight days after his birth. And he was born in Israel um, that he mentions of the tribe Benjamin. Benjamin is a tribe in Israel. Um, and then Hebrew of Hebrews just means he was raised um, 
in the Hebrew language or around Jewish customs. And then it says uh, blah, 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 a Pharisee, Pharisees, you know, um, people who believe they are, their law does not, they, their law is above God's law, basically. Um, and then Paul's father was also a Pharisee. So he just kind of maps out how his, in the beginning of his life, he was just kind of operating, living in the flesh. Paul felt like he did not have to abide by God's law before he met with Jesus, before, he spoke, before Jesus spoke to him, which ultimately means he wasn't saved. Um, and he also thought that he was righteous um, or could be righteous, even though he was a Pharisee and believed that he his law was above God's, he still thought that he could be righteous, but righteousness comes from God. Um, and righteousness is a, a, a an example of having a relationship, relationship, a unity with God. Um, so I'm going to read verse seven, and it says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to, oh, let me stop there. Okay. So, Basically, Paul is saying everything that he did in his past was of this world. Um, and because it was of this world and not rooted in Jesus, it was a law. It wasn't worth it. It's, it kind of has no meaning now. Now that he's walking with Jesus, um, he gains a lot. He gains so much more than his past. That's kind of like what those couple verses mean. Um then verse 10 says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Now, what do we mean? What do, what do we mean? What did he mean when he said that? I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. What do we think Paul means? By, well, let me just break that down first. What do you think Paul means when he says, I want to know Christ? I know that may seem like a dumb question, but I want to see if somebody could break it down for me. Nobody? Okay. How about this question then? How can we know Christ? Paul says he wants to know Christ. How can we know Christ? Uh, learn about him. I think to know Christ is to walk with Christ. And we can know Christ by learning about him from the word or from others. Yes. Oh, sorry, I was going to say that. Um, yes, I agree. Um, what I also took from that is just acknowledging that we are nothing without Jesus. Paul says he wants to know him. I want to know Jesus, but to know him is to understand that I cannot live my life according to how I want, it, want to live it. And that's what Paul was doing. He was living his life according to how he pleased. And ultimately it was um, displeasing to God. Um, so getting to know Christ or just having that yearning to know about Christ and who he is. First, we have to just say, you know, Father God, I want to give my life to you. Just welcome him in your heart um, and to understand that you can't partially commit to him. He's not a convenient God. Um, you can't come and go as you please. Although it may seem like he keep forgiving me. I keep doing this stuff. He keep forgiving me time and time. And that may seem like it's logical, but it's not. Um, so we have, just have to acknowledge that we need Jesus. That's it. That's what I took um, for that part. And then when Paul says, Becoming like him in his death. Um, does anybody, before I say anything, wants to kind of explain what you think Paul means by that? Okay. 
um, becoming like him in his death. So I just kind of took that as fighting to the very end um, to bring people closer to Jesus. Jesus died for us. He died ultimately so that we can be saved. So I think it's really powerful that Paul is in his predicament is saying like, and mind you, he's in jail while he's saying this, okay? He's saying like, I want to be like Jesus. Like, I'm going to fight for his sons and his daughters and I'm going to continue to spread the gospel until my very last breath. That's what I took it at until I die. Um, just so I can bring people closer to God. Um, because that's our jobs, you know, as disciples and believers. We are obviously to walk the walk and talk the talk, but we're ultimately supposed to bring people closer to God. All right. Um I'm uh, almost Gab, done. quick question before you go. Do you think that also can mean mean a forgiveness? Uh, just because before Jesus died, he told people basically forgive them for they not know no better. So I, I took that as just forgiving people and have kind of an open heart and always giving grace. Yes, that's good for sure. Um, definitely forgive people. And they're, I'm bringing church hurt back up again because that's where that can also play a part into like people hurt us in the church. Forgive them and try to move on. Pray for them, forgive them, try to move on. Because at the end of the day, we don't share a grade with any of these people. And we have to worry about our own salvation. So just forgive them. So yeah, that's that's good. Um, and I can see where you would uh see that as well. Forgiving and just worrying about yourself, worrying about your own walk while also still sharing the gospel. Thank you, Elijah. Um, okay, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Very simple. Christ, the prize is Jesus and being with him in heaven. So keep pushing, always go forward, never go backwards. That's it. That's what I took that as, at least. Um, I'm going to go down to verse 17, and we're about to close out the chapter verse 17 says join together in following my example brothers and sisters and just as you have us as a model keep your eyes on those who live as we do me and Ariel and Jackie was talking a little bit about this before we started but I took the as stay connected to people who are passionate about Christ if you are trying to strengthen your relationship your walk with, with Jesus it's going to be kind of hard to do that if you're hanging around people who don't respect those things or your beliefs, who don't honor it, and who don't care to. Again, I like I said, we are supposed to, you know, minister to people and to bring people closer to Jesus, but you cannot force them. I say this all the time. Everybody has a choice. Um, but it does no good for us if we're trying to become better, if we keep entertaining things that feed our flesh. This whole chapter three is just about the flesh. So it does us no good if we continuously feed it. And we know that it's wrong, that we shouldn't do it. So stay connected to people that are passionate about Christ. And if you aren't around people that aren't passionate about Christ, pray for them and try to. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I'll correct those that surround you who's not following. Um, without well, them or judging. Well, that's a good question. So I don't think, so yes, we can share our beliefs. We can stand firm on what we believe in and our relationship and our walk with Christ and who Jesus is to us. But I don't think it's our job to say like, all y'all, all y'all going to hell and this, like, yeah, it might be true. It might be true. But if they don't understand it just by you saying, I'm saved, I don't want to do that. But they're not going to understand, like, they're not going to further understand the rest of your points. They're not going to understand why you want to be saved. They, they just, they don't have the understanding just yet. I don't know if anybody else wants to answer it, but um, 
I'm all you can really do is pray. And you can ex you can explain why a little bit. It's saying like I just I just I'm growing with Christ and I want to better myself. And if they try to challenge that, then that gives you the answer right there. They can't handle it. They're not ready. And then they can come with whatever conclusion and opinions that they want to. But as long as you're standing firm in what you believe in your word and your walk, just keep going. You think Paul, like Paul was almost like killed. People was plotting on him. Um, the governor was plotting on him, trying to bring him back to Jerusalem to kill him based off of his belief. And they didn't have any proof as to why he was locked up. They just locked him up basically because he saw Jesus after he was dead. So there's plenty of examples. Even uh, last month, right? No, no, yeah, November, we learned a lot about uh, the Pharisees and how they like watched real life miracles, Jesus healing people, raising people from the dead. They saw for their own eyes and they chose not to believe. Everybody has a choice. Stand firm on what you believe. Connect to people that believe the same thing you believe. And pray for those that don't. That Maybe that one day that they will get on one accord. But continue to live as an example so that they can feel the light and love of Jesus in you. I don't know if that answered your question. Um, Cheyenne says, to answer Ariel's question, I believe it's our job to be a living example before them. The Bible says for us to work out, work out our own soul salvation with fear and trembling. I think if we live right and direct correctly, we are doing our job for sure. It's going to be hard for people to believe that you a believer if you still out here doing whatever you want to do. It's not going to convince them at all. So. Gotta be a living example. Okay. And the last verse before concluding, I want to go to verse 20. Um, and it says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. You should all want to go to heaven. Um, and Jesus will transform us and change our hearts and change the desires of our hearts. But we have to accept him. Um, there's going to be people, again, like we just said, that disagree with you, that don't want to see you prosper in Jesus. And that might be hurtful because sometimes it might be the people that are closest to you, your friends, coworkers, family, whoever. But do not let that stop you from running this race because the prize is Jesus the prize is heaven and the world we're not we hear this all the time we are not uh in this world we're of this world so we live here but we cannot operate in worldly things and worldly desires so it can be hard sometimes it can be very discouraging but again Jesus is the prize and no man woman boy girl thing money job whatever nothing on this planet can give you the reward that jesus can so i just want to leave you with just some just some things before um we wrap up and pray um through these chapters x 25 26 and philippians 3 my big takeaway from it is your past is your past um again paul literally was one way before jesus changed his name and i believe Jesus is trying to change our names. Um, he wants He wants to change our names. He wants to rewrite our story, but we won't answer. We won't answer the call. We're just so stuck in our old name, our old way, our past. We love it so much. We have so much fun. I might lose my boyfriend, might break up with me. Blah, blah, blah. Like We just might be just so afraid to let go of the past. But all it took was for Jesus to tell Paul, was Saul, 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 you was persecuting me. Nah, that can't happen no more. Follow me. <laughs> you are you are my servant. Follow me. And I'm changing your name from Saul to Paul. And I know that's like, it seems to be very simple. And I know this walk can be hard. But the people in this Bible have had it harder. They they definitely had it harder. Um, and the people in other countries in this world have it harder. Some people can't even they can't even have a Bible in their homes. 
because they're being killed just for simply believing and saying the name of Jesus. So Jesus wants to change our name. He wants to call us higher. We just have to answer the call. Um, so don't give up. Keep chasing. Keep fighting. Stay in the race. The prize is literally already ours. Victory is ours. We are victorious with Jesus. He is the prize. But we have to be up for the challenge. And we have to be consistent. Um, we can't slow down. Got to keep pushing. So that is it. I am done. Does anybody have anything they want to say? Comments, questions? Anything they want to add as a word of encouragement? Uh, next Tuesday is the last Bible study of the month. And then in January, we will start again. And we may have two new teachers in January. I'm just waiting for one to respond to the call. And uh, I'll talk to the other on Sunday. Um, but yes. So, and check out the Voice of the Martyr app. It's an app you can put on your phone, Voice of the Martyr. You can check out persecution all over the world. The daily prayer calendar that you can use to pray for the body of Christ all over the world. In countries that um, you've never heard of. <laughs> And Bible Memory is an app that can help you memorize Bible verses. You can pick your own verses and memorize, them, practice them. I'm being told. All right, that's it. Also, uh, got questions. Favorite app of all time. Got questions. It, it helps me a lot. Whenever I have questions or should I do this or what do Christians think about that? I'm sorry, Jesus says about that. It, it provides a clear and concise answer. Yes, I can uh, agree to that. When I got questions that would be getting me through as the answer to every single thing you think of. Um, okay, so with that being said, Jeremiah Well, can you pray us out, sir? You know, I figured this was gonna happen. <laughs> but yeah, no problem. Go for it. Uh Lord, I first off, we thank you for waking us up on today and allowing us to see another day. I thank you for all your blessings and how you continue to watch over us. Um, if anyone's traveling home, I ask you to uh, shield, protect, and cover them as they make it to the highways and byways. And God, I just thank you for being an amazing God and just keeping us covered. Um, we love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Good night, everybody.